quick disclaimer. Uh, this video is based on my understanding of things, of resolution, seeing, and all of those uh, things. Uh, there can be controversies, debates around all of that, so this video is not the end-all truth of everything. Uh, there are other opinions out there, keep that in mind. And if there are things that are actually wrong in this video, which is possible, you may want to double-check the comments to see whether anyone has disagreed with what I'm saying, and they might actually be right. So double check everything. But with that, let's get into the video. Hey guys, Squiff the Lazy Geek here. Welcome back to the channel. Still the rainy season here in Tokyo. We're actually getting some sunny days, but usually cloudy nights. I haven't imaged in a long time and I need my hit, but I have to wait and be patient. Uh, summer is also not a great season for us photography in Japan, but I'll make it work somehow. Anyway, in the meantime, I still want to make videos. I don't have that many topics, but one of the topics I wanted to talk about is resolution and astrophy. And resolution is basically how, sm how much of the small details in the target objects, whether they're galaxies or nebula, you can actually capture with your equipment. And that whole topic is actually super subtle and full of complexity. It's going to be awesome. We're going to look at this. So the spur for this, the trigger for this video, has been my latest video, or a recent video, about the QHY53 uh, 715C camera that has tiny 1.45 micrometer side pixels that allow me to uh, get more details on my uh, on this QHY camera compared to my standard Tope Tech camera with an IMX571 sensor that has larger pixels of uh, 3.76 micrometer size. And so let's go into the details. Now, before I go directly into the resolution and how, how, what are the smallest details of the objects that we can capture using a specific piece of equipment, I will go and just touch upon how we measure the size of stuff in space. Uh, we will not be using light years or anything like that, but we'll be looking at like the size as it appears to us standing on Earth without knowing the distance to a particular object. And so to do that, we use arc angles. We basically use angles. And the logic is simply like, okay, let's say I'm looking up there at Andromeda Galaxy. Okay, and I point my finger at what end, at one end, one edge of the Andromeda galaxy, and then I point my another like hand to the other end of the Andromeda galaxy, and I'm saying like, okay, the Andromeda galaxy, like one edge is to the left on the left hand, one edge is on the right hand here, and I can just say that the angle between my two hands there. That angle there is the angular size of the galaxy. I don't need to know the distance to the galaxy, anything like that. I know that angle. And so we can measure distances, or effectively, effectively the size of features in the objects that we want to image using such angles. Uh, they're measured in like arc degrees, in arc minutes, 1 60th of a degree, and in arc seconds, 1 60th of a minute, or 1 3060th of a degree. So that's where all of those uh, measures, even when guiding come, or when doing color alignment, those arc seconds, arc minutes measurements uh, come from that. Okay, so we know how we can measure uh, the size of details and features in uh, space. So now we can look uh, deeper into the, uh, the actual logic of uh, resolution. So let's start with my setup. So my setup that I used uh, last time was uh, my Quattro 150P. It's uh, the setup that has a focal length of 517 millimeters. It has an aperture of 150 millimeters and it has uh, pixel sizes, the pixel of my sensor using the QHY camera were 1.45 micrometer. Okay, and now you can see I'm actually on my computer and I'm using the field of view calculator from astromate.tools because it also provides me with the angular size the, the amount, the feature size that each pixel can rec record. The smaller the pixels, the finer the details they could potentially record because they cover a smaller amount of sky. And I input my telescope, here it is, with an aperture of 150 millimeters, focal length 517, and I input my camera with this resolution here, the pixel size of 1.45. So that's the QHY camera. And you can see that we get a result of 0 0.58 times 0 0.58 arc seconds per pixel. That is my resolution. If my pixels were larger, like the same size as the uh, um, IMX uh, 571, 
uh, sensor, then I would be having 1.5 arc seconds per pixel. So my resolution, the number is bigger, but it means that I cannot resolve as small details as I could with the smaller pixels. Okay, so that's one thing. We know our resolution per pixel, but that is not enough because there's another important factor in there. It is the resolution that can be achieved by your telescope optics. How much fine details can your telescope, your optics, actually resolve? Because even if your pixels can resolve uh, very tiny details, even if they have, the, the pixels are infinitely small, they cannot resolve more than what your actual telescope can resolve. With perfect optics, and if you're in space, <laughs> the uh, resolution that your, your telescope can resolve is limited by the wave nature of light. And there have been multiple ways in trying to measure how much fine, fine details are, what is the minimum size of details of features that the telescope can resolve. And one of the ways to measure that minimum size was to basically look at binary stars. And uh, when, because of the wave nature of light, when you point your telescope at a star, the star will appear as a central blob surrounded by an airy disk, by a small disk. And this is because of the wave nature of light. And so if you look at the size of that airy disk and you take a double star, two stars, one, one next to the other, if you put them just as close as possible until their airy disk touch, this is basically the point where you can perfectly resolve those two stars as a separate entity. And the size, like the, the actual size of the airy disk, will depend on the aperture of the telescope. Effectively, the bigger the aperture, the smaller the airy disk. So there's an inverse relationship there. Which means that a telescope with a very large aperture, because the star's airy disks are very small, they, then the telescope with this big aperture can resolve stars, double stars that are much closer to one another than a telescope with a smaller aperture. And that criteria of using the airy disk size is basically called the Rayleigh criteria. But if you're looking at uh, double stars, like features of an object effectively that are very close to one another, well, even if those stars are kind of touching, you can still see them as some kind of elongated uh, peanut shape right? Some, something like that. So you can say that, okay, even if the stars are starting to overlap like that, uh, I'm still able to resolve them as two separate entities, even if they're, they've started to merge together. And so that can only be done like kind of experimentally. And this is called Dawes limit, which is a bit more optimistic. And you can see we have in the Astromania tools, the same screen that we looked at earlier, we have the Dawes limit of 0.77 arc seconds. And this is the smallest feature size that my telescope can resolve, assuming perfect optics. So the real number is going to be above that. And this Dawes limit was attained like experimentally. The Rayleigh criterion is pure math and physics. The Dawes limit is, uh, let's look through a telescope and see at what point I can no, can no longer resolve those two binary stars as two separate stars. And if I take my aperture here and I increase it to something like 200 millimeters, you can see that the number here gets smaller my telescope, 200 millimeters telescope, can resolve finer details, the optics can resolve finer details than a telescope with a smaller aperture. Okay, so now we've uncovered two things, right? There is your per pixel resolution that your pixels can achieve. It depends on your pixel size and it depends on your focal lengths. But then we also have the, the effective like resolution of your telescope system, of your optical system, which depends on the telescope aperture and the telescope optics. So the quality of those optics uh, and this is characterized by the Dawes limit. The bigger the aperture, the better. And if we have only those two criteria, which is really the case if you're having a telescope that's floating in space, then the detail that you can resolve is the larger figure of the two, effectively. Or is it? Because <laughs> then we go inside 
because then we have to go in, into signal theory and the Nyquist sampling theorem. The Nyquist theorem basically is, is a very, very well-known result. If you have like a sine wave, okay, you have a sine wave that uh, has a specific frequency. Let's say the frequency is 100 hertz. So you have like the sine wave uh, oscillates 100 times per second like that. Okay, so we have that signal, but we are wanting to do some digital signal processing. So we're going to just take samples of that particular signal at given points without even knowing that it is a sine wave of frequency 100 hertz. So we're going to say like, okay, we look at the sine wave and we can see like, okay, here we're going to take a point. We'll know the value of that point and when we took it. And then maybe here we're going to take another point. And then there we're going to take a point. And then here we're going to take a point. Each point is a sample. So I can say like, okay, I took one sample every 0.05 seconds. One sample every 0.05 seconds. Can I reconstitute the signal knowing that its frequency was 100 hertz? And the answer in that case would be no. Uh, this is because your sampling rate needs to be basically twice, twice as fast as the signal's uh, frequency or the signal's period, effectively. So if your signal has a frequency of 100 hertz, then your sampling rate needs to be twice as fast as that. It needs to be at least 200 hertz, which would be 0 0.005 seconds between each sample at a maximum. Ideally, we want even faster than that. Okay, but what has this got to do with astrophotography at all? Well, it so happens that images we take, they're just signal, and it is uh, rep represented on a 2D plane. Uh, we could even like draw it as a 3D image, let's say the amplitude, the brightness of each pixel over your 2D plane. It would have some kind of like oscillations and changes. You could even draw a line, like look at one of your pixel rows and just plot the value of each, each pixel and you'd get like some kind of, uh, of curve, right? With your, your pixels. And that kind of curve can be approximated or even uh, perfectly uh, reached using uh, a decomposition of sine waves, basically a Fourier transform of actually Fourier ser series. You add many, many, many different sine waves of, diff of different phases and frequencies and you're able to reconstitute your signal even if your signal isn't even periodic in the first place. And so knowing that, you basically know what the frequency of your signal is. And the higher the frequency, the smaller features we have, the more the signal is moving all over the place. And so you can think of your pixel size, of the size of the side of your pixel or the diagonal of your pixel as basically representing a sampling rate. You have a signal, from space, effectively, light from space. It has some features and it could have like very high frequency feature details and the uh, and you're sampling that feature using square pixels. And the smaller your pixel, the faster you're effectively sampling the signal. You're doing spatial sampling of a spatial signal. And what this means effectively, if I look back at my field of view calculator and I look at my DAWs limit of 0.77 arc seconds compared to my resolution per pixel of 0.58 arc seconds, I could even say like, actually, if I wanted to really capture all of the details that my telescope is physically capable of capturing, assuming perfect optics, I would want my pixel resolution to be like maybe something like 0.35 arc seconds per pixel. So maybe like I would want a pixel size of let's say 1.2, something like that, or even less, like one micron, like completely crazy tiny pixels. Maybe this would be good enough, right? And even that is not quite enough because instead of like having a sampling at twice the rate because our pixels are square and we need to think about the diagonal, uh, we could actually think about sampling at three times the rate. So that would be for a telescope that's floating in space with perfect optics for a given aperture with your pixel size. So now we know about your per pixel resolution. We know about the maximum resolution that can be afforded by your telescope. And we know about the Nyquist sampling that basically says that if you really want to get all of the details that can possibly be taken by your telescope, you would want your pixel resolution to be at least 
twice as small as your DAW's limit for your equipment. So but that, that really means like crazy, completely crazy resolutions. And it's not really possible or, or even something we want to do in our case. And the usual recommendation says something like we want one arc seconds per pixel. So why would we want to go so low less than half that? And the reason why we often recommend something as like the perfect sampling or the perfect resolution per pixel as one arc seconds has to do with our atmosphere. Obviously, we're on the surface of the Earth. When we're pointing our telescope to uh, space, we are looking through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is moving around all of the time. It acts as a blurring effect. It has a blurring effect on, your, on the objects that we are trying to uh, capture. And there are tons of subtleties and nuances about seeing in that. Like if you have a telescope with larger optics, which in theory is able to resolve more details because it's looking through a very wide column of air that might be like have more like changes within that color column of air in terms of turbulences, then the, the image taken by your large telescope might be blurred more than if you have taken the image with a smaller telescope that goes through a smaller column of air, but your smaller telescope is less able to resolve details because of its small aperture. So it's kind of a lose-lose scenario. We could have a huge telescope that can resolve a lot, but because it co goes through like a, a wider column of atmosphere, it's more sensitive to the seeing, to those atmospheric kind of movements all around. But like if you have a smaller telescope to avoid the seeing effects, to try to limit the impact of this atmospheric blurring on your system, well, you're not able to resolve as many details in the first place because of your aperture. So really lose-lose situation. And seeing really more than DAW's limit is really the limiting factor. Now seeing itself is often expressed in arc seconds as well. And it's basically telling you like how much your, your atmosphere will be blurring the images and telling you like with that blur, what is the size, the minimum size of a feature the, the maximum amount of detail that you could actually capture. So if you're seeing that you're seeing is two arc seconds, then it means like the, uh, the minimum size, the smallest detail you could capture is two arc seconds. And therefore, if we look at the Nyquist uh, sampling theorem and we take into account the fact that your pixels are square, you're going to be looking for pixel sizes that might re have a resolution or, or of roughly one third of this two arc seconds of seeing. So that would be something like 0 0.7 arc seconds per pixel would be the good value for you. The seeing in Tokyo is usually terrible and we have again from Astromate Tools, a really good tool to kind of see, compared to your seeing, whether your setup is having the right resolution. If your setup has enough resolution to capture all of the available details, we say it is well sampled. If your setup doesn't have enough resolution to capture all of the details available for you to capture, we say that the system is undersampled. And if your system has been set up that it's trying to capture uh, more finer details that are then are available to you, we can say that your uh, system is oversampled. And as I was saying, we have a calculator in Astromy Tools as well. Again, links in the description along with links to my equipment if you guys are interested. I've set up my telescope with this focal length here and the uh, camera pixel size from the QHY camera that I have on, on loan. And, and you can see we have the ability to select our scene. Like typically seeing would be around these uh, numbers. In Tokyo with the jet stream and all sorts of weird stuff, our scene is usually in this area. Now in this area with this poor seeing, and this is like an average value, then you can see that uh, the ideal pixel size would be roughly 1.33 1, 1 to 2.5 arc seconds per pixel. And that means that I am, with this setup, oversampled because I have 0.58 arc seconds per pixel. If I had okay seeing, I would still be a bit oversampled. If I have good seeing, meaning like the, the size of details that is available for me to capture is even smaller, then suddenly I, uh, I become well sampled. I have like almost the ideal pixel size being between roughly 0 0.33 
uh, arc seconds and one arc seconds per pixel and we're at 0 0.58 like kind of like in the middle that would be perfect so for good seeing my setup is ideal uh, and then we have like exceptional seeing something like in Chile and the mountains of Chile uh, then you have something like then this particular setup even though we have those crazy tiny, tiny pixels would be undersampled we're not capturing all of the details that are available to us in exceptional scene. Okay, but things still get complex. Yeah, we're still not done, guys. St things will still get complex because there are ways that we can uh, counteract the seeing. One way is to do some post-processing to basically try to guess uh, the function by which the image that you took has been blurred. So that function we call the point spread function. It can be deduced more or less by looking at your star shapes in your image. And we can try to, in, to reverse it, to try and counteract the blurring effects of the atmosphere, to, kind, to try and counteract the defects in your optics, to try and counteract the guiding, the guiding errors that you've had that also introduce blur to the image. You can also counteract the fact that we use square pixels rather than round pixels. A lot of things can be counteracted by trying to reverse engineer that blurring function or point spread function. And this is what a deconvolution algorithm like the magical blur exterminator algorithm in PixInsight lets us do. And so that lets us go, be, go a bit beyond, you know, those limitations that we typically have. And another way that we can go beyond those limitations would be to use very short exposures because the seeing numbers that we get in weather forecasts, for instance, they're average seeing. And if we're taking 300 second exposures, then we'll have the average seeing. Okay, nothing, nothing to do there. But if you take short exposures, and Astro Biscuit on his channel mentioned something like five seconds be, being like a good number if you're going to do deep space imaging uh, while still, still trying to freeze the scene. If you're taking short exposures like that, you're sampling the scene. You're not looking at the average scene, you're sampling the scene. And some of your exposure will have better than the average. Some of your exposure will have worse than average. Some of your exposures will have the average scene. But the better than average will be able to show more details than the other exposures. And so if we select only those exposures with the largest amount of details, the, the smallest details, uh, captured, then we can effectively beat the average seeing. And so if my site like in Tokyo has uh, poor seeing, which it usually has, by using lucky imaging, the technique of basically taking, taking many short exposures and only retaining the ones with the best seeing, which in a stacking algorithm could be done by simply looking at the star sizes using uh, FWHM and using a weighting formula based on that, then my poor scene could become basically good scene, right? And then suddenly with my sensor that should be extremely oversampled, we are at the ideal size. So com combine that lucky imaging to effectively find the areas of the, the timings of good scene amongst your poor seeing in general, and you combine something with Blur Exterminator, then you can start to really achieve really, really good results. And I'll go into the last subtlety uh, in this video. I'm really sorry, this is a long video, but I hope it's interesting. But the last subtlety is everything I've said up to now is kind of assuming that you're using a monochrome sensor. But the sensor of the camera that I've been mentioning, the 715, as well as the sensor of the 571, my main, main imaging camera, they're color sensors. And color sensors, they're just monochrome sensors with small, tiny filters on each pixel. So effectively, my pixels, the first one will be red, green, green, blue, red, green, green, blue, etc. Each pixel is dedicated to a specific color. In the end, when we are trying to get like, okay, what was the actual color of any given pixel, we have to look at the neighboring pixels at the same time to kind of like get information about the other colors, fusion that together and say like, okay, this pixel was this particular shade of blue with this light intensity. This is what we do with color cameras when we do the bearing. Uh, but what that means is we relied on information of neighboring pixels. So effectively, 
we're lowering the resolution because we are averaging some values out of neighboring pixels. So your effective resolution is lower than the the resolution of, the, of an equivalent monochrome sensor. So when you're looking at those calculators there, if you're using a color camera, your uh, the resolution that gives you the 0 0.58 arc seconds per pixel here, it's actually maybe closer to something like 0 0.7, 0 0.8 arc seconds. That the actual resolution of your colored sensor will actually depend on the debayering algorithm that's used. So it really can change things quite a bit there. And this is a subtlety that I don't see mentioned often. But always remember, debayering uses information from multiple pixels. So each pixel is actually the combination of information from a larger surface area. And therefore, each pixel is actually the result of a lower resolution than if you had only a monochrome sensor. And that justifies using color sensor with tiny pixels even more than just monochrome. So when you're combining all of those techniques, okay, where you're having a color sensor, so effectively my resolution is actually worse than what is com uh, computed by astronomy.tools, we add blur exterminator to the mix. We then add like lucky imaging to the mix. We can really achieve resolutions and like capture details, more details than what we could expect by just looking at the numbers. And so we can kind of overcome are the seeing limitations, the atmospheric limitations. One thing we cannot ever overcome is the DAWs limit, the actual resolution limit of your telescope. But remember, Nyquist theorem tells us that we want to sample at twice of even three times the rate using like uh, smaller pixels. And when you take into account OSC and the loss of resolution there, then uh, something that might on the face of it sound crazy, like 0 0.6 arc seconds uh, resolution on my setup in Tokyo with just an aperture of 150 millimeters, suddenly makes sense. What are your thoughts on this? I'm not an expert. And as I mentioned in the start of the video, some of this information might be wrong. So. Whatever is wrong, go down in the comments and fix it. Tell me what is wrong. And if you're watching the video and learning stuff, check the comments as well to see other opinions. There's always conflicted, uh, conflicting opinions in astrography. It's always very interesting. It's always amazing. And I love this hobby. Uh, uh, so re look at the comments while you're there. You may want to like the video. It really, really helps the channel out. You can subscribe to the channel if you're new, in which case, welcome. And sorry that you had to start with a super theoretical video. And if you want to support me, help me make more of those videos and keep the channel going because you guys truly make the channel possible, you could join my Patreon, link in the description as well, or my channel as a member. And every bit helps a lot. So thank you so much, everyone. With that, as always, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars and I'll see you next time.